The Great Step, millenniums of events, hundreds of nomadic tribes and people. They lived, worked, made discoveries, conquered large tracts of lands and left us some mysteries. To learn more about it, watch project called Enigma of the Great Step. Fall, year 1654. The delegation led by the statesman and traveler Fyodor Isakovich Baikov comes to the upper Irtysh. The mission of Moscow noblemen is the most generous, to stop Chinese expansion of Russian lands in a peaceful manner. Therefore, the cargo mainly consists of gifts and letters to Manchu Emperor from the Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich Romanov. The route from Moscow, Pervo, Prest, Olnaya to the headquarter of the Qing dynasty passes through lands of the western Mongol Oirat Khan Ablai, who comes from the Khoshu tribe. In these lands, Baikov witnessed a historic event, beginning of the construction of the Buddhist monastery Ablai Kit. Later, people will be interested more in the construction itself and the treasures behind it than in the journey of Baikov to Beijing, which ended in vain. But his first notes about the construction of the temple will be researched by several generations of archaeologists and historians. Masters for the construction of the city were sent from Chinese kingdom. The temple city became known as Ablai Hit or Ablai Kit. Ablai Kit. Jungar's Buddhist monastery of the 17th century is located 60 kilometers to the south from the Uskomenogorsk city, the picturesque place not far from the lakes of Sibisk. The beauty of these places is one of the reasons why the eastern part of Kazakhstan is called Pearl of Asia. There are a lot of questions. Was the wonderful landscape the only reason of the temple construction here? What explains the construction of the Buddhist monastery on the Kazakh land? And did Ablai have only peaceful purpose in the construction of this holy shrine? Buddhism, like all other religions of the world, is spread on the territory of Central Asia through the trade routes of the Silk Road. Trade caravans started moving, merchants began to carry their goods from west to east, from east to west. Of course, not only the trade was the main goal of the Silk Road, but also diplomacy and the spread of cultural standards. Art, culture, dance and painting it was also a path of religion. Through the Silk Road, world religions, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity and Islam began to spread. One of the first world religions was Buddhism, which arose in the fourth century in India and Nepal. Out of these centers, where Buddhism became a powerful religion and philosophical course, it moved to the east. Oirats adopted Buddhist philosophy postulates and were building the sanctuaries around which big cities were settling. The Mongols went to Tibet to receive monastic ordination and through the routes forged by trade caravans. Lamas came to the steppe. Representatives of Buddhism, Lamas, was really focused on the spread of Buddhism among the Kazakhs. They knew that they would be defeated by the Jungars, and their main goal was to spread Buddhism to avoid losing their influence in the Great Steppe. As far as I know, such temples of worship were built not only on the wide territory of eastern Kazakhstan, but also on other several areas of Kazakhstan. The earliest monuments of Buddhist culture were found in the southern Kazakhstan, especially significant areas in the region of Simirice. In the early 7th century, the famous Buddhist mentor, traveler and philosopher Sung Sang visited the region. Sung Sang writes that some of Turkic people, especially nobility and elite, professed Buddhism and expressed a great interest to this religion. He had lots of conversations, explained the various kinds of dogma to Turkic Hagan, gave different rules of behavior and attitude to life. 
It is very important to know that Buddhism already had, let's say, adherents among Turkic Khagans, Turkic nobility, and among the common people. At that time, there was no kind of relations between Mongolia and China, so Muslim Central Asia also did not have any relationships with China. Therefore, the course of sedentary lifestyle adoption was taken. People could be able to manufacture different things and keep livestock themselves. Even there are documents where one of the prominent Mongolian leaders asked the Russian Tsar to give them pigs, chickens and other domestic animals to become a sedentary population. And when Baikov stayed here during his journey to China, Ablai gifted him 50 horses. It is interesting to note that in those days, Tengrism still remained the main religion of the Turkic people. However, in the western and southern parts of the Khanat, people professed Buddhism. Despite the fact that the native religion of the rulers was the heavenly god, they did not oppose the spread of Buddhism among their people. Flemish Franciscan missionary William of Rubruck became aware of this when he traveled to the Mongol Empire on behalf of Louis IV in 1253. He extensively described Buddhist temples in the cities of Karakorum and Kailak and mentioned people in yellow robes with prayer beads in their hands. There, all priests shave their head and beard and wear yellow robes. In those days, when they entered the temple, they put two benches and sit on the ground in the direction of the choir, holding books in their hands, which sometimes they put on the benches. And while they are in the temple, their heads are uncovered. They read in silence and remain silent. Wherever they go, they have some kind of rope in their hands, with 100 or 200 kernels, like our prayer beads. Thus, Buddhism became one of the first world religions penetrated and spread to the territory of Kazakhstan. And by this time of arrival of Fyodor Baikov with the diplomatic mission, this religion was not a new one for the Great Steppe. It was when the Mongol Empire was formed. It was when the Mongol Empire was formed. The eastern part was close to China and the western part, Oirats, were located closer to us. And in the 17th century, after the formation of the Kazakh Khanat, there was a plan to occupy these territories. These territories were seized. Oirats, Mongols, Kalmyks, Olats, Jungars and others began in building their fortresses and sanctuaries. And yurts were gradually put around these fortresses. People started to conduct household and farming. Вокруг этих крепостей эти постепенно как обычно обрастали, появлялись юрты, начинало ли вести какое-то хозяйство. As we know, Buddhism is the religion of the city. Sedentary lifestyle is very important for prosperity and learning of this religion. Therefore, the choice of location for the sanctuary construction is a significant decision. It requires a detailed analysis. Для своих храмов. Tibetan lamas used to choose the most beautiful places to build their monasteries. Whatever place we found with Tibetan monastery or temple, we wonder what an amazing place it is. It's so picturesque in all respects. It is crystal water of mountain lakes. It is a valley of rivers. And Ablai Kit was located in such a wonderful place. But while planning the construction, Tai Shi Ablai thought not only about the surrounding landscape. He was an experienced leader and he knew that geopolitics always plays a major role. Let me mention that there was another goal. Trade between China and Russia was established and some of the northern parts passed through these territories. Therefore, seizure of these territories was aimed at control of these roads. For example, to put the customs post and so on. Monasteries were not only the centers of culture, contributing to the development of writing and literature among the Mongols. Often they had defenses, and if it was necessary, they could turn into a fortress. How was the foresight of Tai Shi Ablai justified? The foresight of Ablai, who decided to strengthen his monastery and to prepare it for defensive actions. Who could prevent fatricide in Ablai Kit? And why was the temple decimated?
In 1657, Ablai Kit was consecrated by a Buddhist missionary priest, Zaya Pandita. The end of construction of the city between mountains coincided with the period of a sharp aggravation of the internal political situation in Western Mongolia. In 1660, there was the first siege. This siege was born on the grounds Hao Bai Bagas Han, Han of Oirats, distributed lands to his two sons, to Ablai Khan and Tsetsin Khan. To Tsetsin Khan, he gave the south part, whereas the Alakol Valley, the left bank of the Irtish, he gave to Ablai Khan. Maybe somehow these lands were not enough for them, and one brother comes to siege. The siege of the monastery city lasted about one and a half months. Ablai conceded his defeat by Ochirtud Setsin, but relatives intervened to this internecine conflict. The legend says that the mothers of the warring Khans seek to stop the carnage. Ochirtud Setsin returned Ablai seized lands, properties, and prisoners. But this calm did not last for long. In 1668 to 1669, the brothers faced each other again. Some believe that the outcome of the conflict was achieved not on the battlefield, but on the chessboard. And here, key figures are the sons of Ablai and Ochirtut Setsin, Sagan and Galdamau. Troops of two sides, troops of relatives stood on both banks of the river Emil in Tarbagatai. To avoid the carnage among Sagan and Galdama went to the center of the battlefield, put a table and began playing chess. When relatives saw that two brothers were playing chess, their hearts softened. Two years later, in 1671, Taishi Ablai migrated to the west. Defeated by local leaders, he was captured and sent to Moscow. For some time, a monastery was still the spiritual center, but in the first half of the 18th century, it completely fell into ruin. The reason why monks left is still unclear. According to one version, because of an attack of the Jungars. According to another, because of a battle with Kazakh Batirs, as always surrounded by a host of legends. There are eight stones on the field between Al-Gabas and the former temple or fortress. These stones are round-shaped with the weight of a ton, and they were put in a megalithic circle. At first came the Jungar soldier, a strong, confident man. He began to lift the stone, but couldn't manage to raise it, because the stone was too heavy. Then the most powerful bow-legged warrior began to lift. He also could not raise the stone. After this, the Kazakh Batir came on the horse, took the stone, and raised it above his head. Jungar warrior, with hostility and hatred, could not bear this and killed the horse with a spear. The stone fell from a height and crashed on these parts and is lying there. The Kazakh army won, and the land belongs to the Kazakhs. <laughs> Probably these massive stones lie there in memory of the fellow soldiers. The second story is about how Tanash took the fortress of the enemy. There were eight fellows and they grew up together. One day, Tanash decided to make a monument to his seven friends. All Kazakhs and Kalmaks stood watching and he brought seven huge stones in honor of his friends. If you look down from the temple, they're laying in about 200 to 300 meters. Almost six years passed since I left the village. In 2009, the stones were still lying. Basically, no one could take them. They're very large and heavy. No one could raise them, and this was the power. Whatever the reason was, the monks left the temple in a hurry. The evidence of this is a bounty of treasure found here. What did travelers and archaeologists discover while studying Ablai Kit? How many years were required for the translation of the Tibetan manuscripts? And is it true that somewhere near the temple, a huge golden statue of Buddha is hidden?
Some reports indicate that Ablai Kit was finally abandoned in 1676. For many years, walls of the monumental building were not ruined till the time when military troops again reached this place. In 1720, an influential and respected commandant, Ivan Mikhailovich Likharev, went to find Yarkand, one of the most populated commercial centers of East Turkestan in ancient times. Someone told him that there was some kind of sanctuary in the fortress not far from the Uskomenogorsk city. He sent their troops of Cossack soldiers, and they found that sanctuary and conducted, let's say, predatory excavations. They collected lots of interesting materials, but the most valuable of them, of course, were manuscripts from Ablai Kit. Long time ago, there was a well-stocked library at the temple. There is no written evidence of it, but it is known from the legends. The legends say that a huge library collection was moved and hidden in one night. I do not know if this is true or not, but they say that all books of the library were loaded onto 30 camels and moved in one night. Some say there were 20 camels. They loaded onto camels and moved in one night. After some time, manuscripts were brought to St. Petersburg, but no one was able to determine and read their content. It was a completely new, unknown language. In February of 1721, the first librarian of Peter the Great, Ivan Schumacher, went on an abroad trip. This interesting story, he sent there is one interesting story. Manuscripts were sent to France to the French Academy of Sciences. They looked through these manuscripts and understood that they did not know neither language nor writings. But I guess they made the translation not to lose their reputation. And they published the translation in Latin, so no one could read it. Over time, the historian Miller met with a Mongolian lama and showed him these manuscripts. And it turned out that they were sacred writings. So the French scientists just made a fake translation at that time. In 1820, 100 years after the discovery of the manuscripts, the famous French scientist orientalist Jean-Pierre Aboul Rimoussat extensively described the history of manuscripts translation in France. This translation was not made by him. He firmly condemned Furman brothers who made the translation without having any idea of the language which they were translating from. Most of the best polyglots of Europe and members of the scientific communities tried to solve the mystery of oblique kit manuscripts, but to no avail. By 1735, only one and a half lines of Tibetan manuscript was translated. It was the beginning of Buddhism. These manuscripts, which were found in Ablai Kit, are the most valuable. They have become a starting point of the study of such an interesting religion as Tibetan Buddhism. Despite the fact that most of the manuscripts were redeployed long ago, Ablai Kit, surrounded by an hour of the mystery and secrets, still attracts scientists' attention. Of course, for us, it is a unique place in terms of history because it is not just the Jungar Monastery. We are very pleased with the excavation started there. Recently, treasure lovers began to destroy this monument. At the time, the fragments of a wooden trunk were kept in a museum of the school in the village Leninka. Now this village is called Sagir. We also have the same fragments of the trunks in our funds. So this means that probably there were some kind of riches and some of treasure were deployed from there, except those which were located in the monastery and which were purely of Buddhist religious content. This assumption has its reasons. The reference books of the 19th century indicate that the streams which flow into the river Ablak V or Oblakit are remarkable with its gold mines. It is a unique place. Exactly there in those mountains in the middle of the 19th century, the first development of the gold mines started. Gold miners from Uskomenogorsk started this development, and till now unions of miners work there. In this regard, also it is an interesting place. Every legend about 
Each legend contains grains of truth. Nothing occurs without reasons. Legends say when the temple becomes being destroyed, the last monks hid the treasure in a small crystal lake, which is located on the territory of the temple. So we need to develop an underwater archaeology. We'll explore the bottom of the lake. We can fulfill this. Local people tell visitors the stories about the golden statue of Buddha hidden in the depths of the lakes of Sibinsk, about jewelry, tools, and other curiosities. But scientists are more interested in the country of origin of these figurines and armor, Syria, Afghanistan, northern India, China, items of different periods, countries, and people. They are a wonderful collection of treasures. There were all sorts of figurines and other curiosities. When the first figurines were taken and brought to St. Petersburg, Peter the Great put them all on the table. He instructed to draw them and put them in the museum, and said that there were very valuable findings and treated them with great attention. As it is known, Russian king especially loved a bronze lamp in the form of an equestrian statue of the Roman commander. Peter the Great did not personally see the sanctuary, but he thoroughly looked through all the maps and plans drawn up by an engineer surveyor, Vasily Shishkov. In 1735, Vasily Shishkov, on behalf of Peter the Great, came here to prospect for minerals. He had a task to describe this temple, and the description by Vasily Shishkov is the most significant one. It is a specific description of the temple which was almost ruined, still something was left. In general, the territory, as Shishkov described, where the shrine was built, had 200 fathoms of length and 120 fathoms of width. The building had two parts, the yard and the temple itself, which was on a massive platform. This architectural know-how makes the building bigger visually. It seems a huge, majestic construction from a distance. Looking on the pictures, we see that interior is preserved. You can see the beautiful wooden columns painted in different colors. These are the symbols of Buddhism. These are Buddhist deities and statues. Columns were placed on the huge bases made of stone. Near the museum, we have stands for the columns of the gate. We used to show them to tourists, but then stands began to disappear from their original place. We decided to bring them here to the museum. In our museum, we have fragments of birch bark, which were found in 1960. They preserved in a good condition and show their religious content. Despite these findings, there are a lot of stories to say and show about Ablaikit. Ablaikit is one of the monuments included in the program of scientific research in the field of archaeology in the coming years. In addition, scientists, historians, and archaeologists believe that the temple can be reconstructed and returned to its former greatness. Of course, now it is the right time to reconstruct and recreate this temple, not as a religious shrine where the service will go, but as a tourist site. Certainly, we museum staff really want these excavations finished with the conservation of the monument so that we could be able to show this monument to the people. There are so many tourists who want to see and learn the history of Ablaikit. And we would like that these excavated findings not simply sent to our museum. We want to make real monuments for tourists to visit, like in Kizil, Kent, or other places. Many attempts were undertaken, but since it is very costly, there was nothing made with this monument. But this monument has a great significance in the history of the region. I think that the main task here is to study the mountain hollows and search for the library collection. It is necessary to organize an expedition. If we find the library, it will make an invaluable contribution to the history of our Kazakhstan.
This monastery was initially built to arrange peace rituals, but witnessed fraternal wars. The whole of Europe was surprised on the scale and greatness of the culture found here. Peter the Great was eager to preserve the image and the content of Ablaikit. The temple existed only a few decades, but over centuries, it continues to be one of the main enigmas of the Great Steppe.